right? Yeah, you're such a servant. Yeah, yeah. I just anyway. All right, I'll do the intro then. You sure you don't want to do it? Do we even have an intro? It's welcome back to two guys in the <laughs> Bible. Do you even pay attention to me? <laughs> Most of the time. Um, well, welcome back to Two Guys in the Bible. We're glad you're joining us on this. You know, it's Friday. We kind of we braved the weather, the we elements. Did, the, the elements. Well, anyway, yeah, we're having some uh, unprecedented cold weather, which I think most of the country is right now, but especially here in uh, East Texas, we're not used to this kind of stuff. Anyway, we're here. It's, it's a Friday, February the twelfth, two thousand twenty-one. A uh, little bit later in the week than we normally do these things, but life gut gets in the way sometimes. So we're glad you're here nonetheless and hope you're doing well. Cody, what's been going on? There's lots of things that have been going on. Lots of very, very absurd things. I think we live in Absurdville. Absurdville? Absurd, the United States of absurdity. Yeah, well, you got to give the people some examples. You know, they this is where they go for all of their for all of their current events. And current events. Well, they probably need to go and somewhere tune else. In to, tune in to two guys in the Bible because they want to hear our expertise. We're just kidding, by the way. Yeah, <coughs> but we do like to respond to some of the craziness going on in the world, and, and then you know, address it from a biblical worldview. That's that's who we are. So, I think something that's happening. I think the the like, and I wish that like I told you yesterday that we could get this on like soundbite, just like on rotation. But there was a reporter at the White House press briefing trying to ask a question to. Jen Psaki, the the press secretary, okay? And it was about transgender, it was about men playing in women's sports mm -hmm. because they think that they're a woman. Right. But she didn't ask the question just like I stated it, which is the simple way to ask the question. She's trying to use all of the politically correct language. And you could see and watch, like, she was struggling. She, I mean, it was yeah. just like, it was so difficult for her to try to communicate <clears throat> to the point where even Jen Psaki afterwards says, I don't understand your question. <laughs> and I'm like, I want to like yell at the TV, no one understands the question. That's right, man. It's because they have reduced themselves to just absolute absurdity. And and so I just sat there and watched that and was like, if you would stop trying to be woke and politically correct and not offend people, you could have asked your question in the clearest way and really not been, and you're not being offensive. Right. You're just stating facts. Right. And here's the here's the deal. Who determines that it's offensive? Do do does something that hurts our feelings, do we get to automatically say, Hey, that's offensive? Well apparently Do we set that standard? No. In the in the United States of Absurdville <coughs> we do. Well, I know that. But I'm sorry, but when you when when something is true, when something is a fact, when something is objectively clear, I'm no, I'm sorry, you are a man. You may want to be a, a woman, you may call yourself a woman, but you are a man, and I'm sorry, if you're offended by that, you're offended by the fact. Well, and the thing that's extremely, you sit there and um, you watch this interaction go back and forth, and then what happens is the press lady gives this bumper sticker answer of, Trans rights or trans rights are human rights. Okay, right. this is the what the question was around. Can a man play in women's sports? All right. All right. Is that is that is that something? Okay, how is it a right for a man to go into a woman's lane and and can an area and just completely dominate? Sometimes brutally dominate. 
in a physical way, a woman. That's what I'll say they don't have the right to do that. Right. Now, if you're talking about rights as in all American citizens and all people, for that matter, need to be treated with dignity and respect, then yeah, they, they everybody deserves those rights. We don't have to agree with somebody's mm-hmm. worldview to respect them as an image bearer of God mm-hmm. and, and, and stuff like that. But I'm sorry, you do not have the right as a man, nor should you ever have the right as a man, to go fight in women's MMA or race in a women's track meet or play in the WNBA. It's called the WNBA for a reason. It's the women's. But see, this is why what I said to you earlier was we can't even have a conversation because our language is not the same. Right. Because when you when we look at them and say you're a man, that their response back is No. No, I'm not. Right. Okay, well what am I supposed Biology to do? Biology and science says otherwise. Yeah, everybody you, says otherwise. You are a man, regardless of your feelings. And did you know that they've done some statistics that most of these, when this whole thing started like in track, these men and these boys that were going to play with the women were terrible. Like, they were bottom yeah, they of the run in the men's yeah. track, and then they come over here and they start winning and beating everybody. Yeah. First of all, that should show that there is a complete there difference. There is a difference. Between... Now, does that mean that uh, there's not some some women out there that could smoke me in a race? Mm-hmm. <laughs> ah, sure. I'm yeah, sure. there is, especially yeah. now. And you know, I'm 37. I'm not as quick as I once was. But overall, is what we're talking about here, guys. You can't. God designed men and women differently, and men most of the time are stronger and faster and quicker than women. That's the way God made us. Mm -hmm. Not only should men not be allowed to go and compete against women, but I would say that women should not be allowed to come and compete against men in physical Mm -hmm. sports. I'm not talking about in pull and and throwing darts and stuff like that. I'm talking about real sports, can athletic. They, can they be on the same team in curling? I'm talking about NASCAR here. Can they curl? Can they do the curling yeah, they game? they can probably do curling. Together? Um, I don't know, man. Is that kind of a co-ed, is that a co-ed when sport? When you're scrubbing that, that ice, man. I don't. These guys are intense. Yeah. Shooting. You know, I think men and women can compete against each other in like Olympic-style shooting. It's, there's some things that are okay, but when it comes to speed, strength, you know, Head to head, um, it's just it's not right, and I'm sorry. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure that out. So let me ask you a question. Questions the, are a dollar a day. The, the people at the top consider it, consider the top people in America the the elites, if you will. The people that are supposed to represent the people, but don't. Yeah, all those people yeah. plus all the you know in our country, Hollywood apparently are people that we're supposed to listen to, which is absurd. Yeah. But anyway, but I mean the elites, all the <coughs> elites that have supposed to be the intelligent, the progressive, they've gone hey, to the colleges. The, the one percenters. The one percenters. Yeah. All of that group of people that we're supposed to listen to, we're supposed to hear from them, they're the ones that have got it all figured out. They're going in the right direction. Are they, are they just lying to be politically correct? Or have they become so darkened and foolish? I think it's a mix. I think there are, especially when it comes to politicians. Politicians yeah. are going to just say it's things whatever they to, want. Yeah. For, to create job security. Right. <clears throat> now, there are some real wackos out there that truly believe the nonsense that they're saying. They, they truly believe that... Uh, I don't know. They truly believe that that men can have babies. T- men can have periods too. Mm-hmm. Like Tampax created a commercial, mm-hmm. you know, and did some a- marketing and mm-hmm. stuff for for men who men also bleed. I think that's what it was. I'm just like, no, no. Well, I mean, yeah, if they cut themselves or something, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. But there's there is true crazies out there that have convinced themselves mm-hmm. that this stuff is real. Right. Uh, but I think most of them, to be fair, 
are just are just saying it. Mm-hmm. I don't think they don't want to get be, fired. They don't want to get fired. There, like there that is one a gal. sense, though, man. When you reject God over and over, right, and you try to set the standard for how everything is, um, there does come a time in which which you're given over, right, to a debased mind. Mm-hmm. You're given over to fully to your own depravity. The Bible says that God put them in a spirit of stupor, <coughs> eyes that cannot see the truth and ears that cannot actually hear. Right. You, you say all the time, you can't even have a conversation with these people. That's because they have ears that cannot hear. Mm-hmm. They're, they, they have eyes that cannot see because they are in this spirit of stupor. Yeah, they've definitely been given over and to think that these things That's are. why it's hard to have a conversation with people that have gone full and flat out uh, woke and politically correct and, and, and everything else. And, and so my argument has come to this. Because I feel like this is where the scripture talks about when you're arguing with a fuel, a fool, stop. Proverbs. That's paraphrase. That's a <coughs> paraphrase. Yeah. But that we need to, like... It's very discouraging and hard when you're trying to evangelize someone when you start with these things. When you start with the things that are absurd, when you start with the things that you can't even talk about because you're not using the same language, why, we shouldn't start there. All right. We should preach the gospel to people because it is the gospel that's the power of God that is salvation. Offensive. And it's offensive. And while preaching the gospel... If we're engaged with these topics, we can try our best to to speak into those things. But um, we're not doing it. We're casting our pearls before swines when we're... I'm not calling anyone a swine. Yeah. Just, I mean, why do we even Cody, have to say that? Why do you have to be so offensive? <laughs> That's a Bible verse. Uh, yeah. Um, we're casting pearls before <coughs> swines when we do this and I think you got to have some discernment when you're out in the public square you need to know when you are casting your pearls before swine but you're also maybe there's maybe there's a sheet somewhere there in the pen right and uh, but you have to be able to to discern that Mm -hmm. Um, if, if everybody there is just it's clearly in a spirit of stupor. They cannot see what you're saying. They cannot hear what you're saying. It's just flat out mockery and hatred and, and they're just losing their minds. Um, yeah, maybe it's time to dust your feet and go on down the road. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, if there's a chance that there's some folks there that may respond to the gospel or it's at least not complete foolishness to them. Uh, because to the natural man, this stuff is foolishness. If you're watching this, you know, and we get some comments every now and then. If you're watching this and you're left in your natural state, I mean, meaning your your own sinful state, we understand that everything we're saying is utter foolishness to you. Mm-hmm. We're not going to pretend it's not. Mm-hmm. But God is in the business of changing people and calling them to himself and what was once foolish to us as well, he has made our treasure. And so that's why we do this. Mm-hmm. It's not... We don't purposely go out and seek to offend people, Cody. But we have to be... We have to understand that when we proclaim God's truth, it is going to offend people because people left in their natural state hate this. Well, and I wouldn't even be talking about this if it wasn't getting thrown at me right. at every angle that it possibly could. And and it wasn't being promoted and propagated by the federal government. Right. I, I mean, mean, in some places it's illegal and you can be we have a, fined and charged for using the wrong pronoun, misgendering someone. We have some, like, assistant <coughs> health secretary, health secretary that is a man that thinks he's a woman and he wants to assist in 
in health related issues yeah this is the absurdity that when I, that I'm talking about we I think in the elite circles generally speaking with some with with some exceptions they have become the most immoral unintelligent human beings I've ever seen yeah. no with exceptions but well, for the they, most part they completely deny objective realities and mm -hmm. objective truths and when you do that except for their own truth they don't deny that but they're trying to live in a way <laughs> that denies all objectivity whatsoever mm -hmm. and when you do that well anything goes mm -hmm. except for intolerance mm -hmm. except for not believe anything goes except for people like you and me believing that not everything goes mm -hmm. and so man they're having to juggle all this stuff around that's why I'm like if you're a feminist and what do you think about you know mm -hmm. biological men pe competing in women's sports mm -hmm. right I mean, it just doesn't make any sense, man. And also, if you're a feminist, every time there's a conservative woman in the public square, and you know that is mm -hmm. well known, mm -hmm. and and she's outspoken about her convictions and her views, she is silent. She is fired. She is deplatformed. Yeah, what do you think about that? Shouldn't the feminists be irate about that? What's her but name? they're not because that's they're not competing to advance the same narrative as they are. I got you. So even if, I don't know, it's like, it's like, okay, I know I'm not going to get along with them on this, but the overall picture, we're on the same side of the fence here. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, I don't know. It's it's just interesting, man. And it's just, when you're, again, when you reject any objective reality and any kind of standard for morality and right and wrong this is what you get mm -hmm. you get people with power this is what's scary mm -hmm. nilly willy and flippantly making decisions that affect all of us mm -hmm. yeah if you yeah. are if you hold a, a public office of any kind you you need to understand that you only have that office. I don't care. Even if it's just a city council member or someone, <clears throat> you need to understand that you only have that position because God ordained it from all of eternity, and you are supposed to be His instrument for upholding justice and in keeping people safe. Mm -hmm. That's your job. Mm -hmm. I don't care if you're just a, a, a mayor of a small East Texas town or you're president of the United States. You are there because God has ordained it to come to pass. You hold that position. And your job is to uphold justice for all people and keep us safe. Mm -hmm. And right now we have people that don't care about either one of those things. They care about everything else. Mm -hmm. I agree. You're fired. Fire all of you. Fire all of them. Can we unplug America? Wait Can, 30 seconds and plug Hold on. Back in? Wouldn't it be awesome if we could get Trump to tell him they're fired? Yeah. Like in his oh, old, man. like, yeah. the old you know. Apprentice, yeah. apprentice voice. That yeah. would be awesome. Because they hate him. And then he gets to fire him. <laughs> that would be cool. <clears throat> He's so orange and bad. You tell you what all this really is, Cody. Mm. All this craziness is incomprehensible. It is. It's a good but transition. But you know, that's a bad thing that's incomprehensible. You know what is a very, very, very good because, thing that's incomprehensible? Right. And it's because of the fact that God is incomprehensible and they're without Him. Right. They're left to depravity and yep. just outright absurdity that's incomprehensible. Incomprehensible. It's incomprehensible. The incomprehensibility we, of God is incomprehensible. How many times can we say this today? <coughs> so we're, should be a counter. Now we're going to transition back to the character of God. Things that are more important. Not in our popcorn theology, our bite-sized <laughs> theology. Uh, the incomprehensibility of God, which we kind of, it kind of relates to what we talked about last week, mm. is God being infinite, uh, you know, without... Uh, I don't know. 
Oh, uh, I have a quote, remember? Oh, yeah, go ahead. He embraces every degree of perfection without limitations. Without limitations, yeah. And so when we talk about his incomprehensibility, it's with respect to our mind, to our understanding, how we think. Because we're finite. Right. And so why, that's why it relates perfectly to what we talked about last mm -hmm. week. Um, and uh, just uh, so that we're clear, because you mentioned this, where I'm getting a lot of this information, and I've tried to do my best to make sure that it doesn't, I'm not just like ripping it off of um, Beaky and Smalley's reform, or Reformed um, Systematic Theology, but that's the book I'm reading, which I would suggest everyone get. Yeah, if you're rich, go buy it. <laughs> or just do what Spurgeon said, sell your shoes or coat and buy books. Yeah. Here's why. <sighs> And there's going to be some people out there that if they ever hear this, they're going to be like, oh, you need to, that's, this is new. You need to read these old, ancient, systematic, I'm, hey, read the old, ancient ones. That's fine. I'm all about that. I'm just saying for the average <coughs> person in the room, which is me, their book is so well written. Yeah. And so, and, and with, with brevity, they, they. They well, nail these things. For instance, they take something like the incomprehensibility of God mm -hmm. and put it in a way where we can comprehend what they're saying. Yeah, it and doesn't mean we can fully comprehend God. Mm -hmm. It means we can comprehend the incomprehensibility of God. See, because they'll what I, what I find is they'll they'll quote like several men, and what you'll know is they've gotten those from other systematic the, theology books or other other books, and that maybe a lot of people don't have a lot of access to. Yeah. But you can have access to this $50 resource that you don't have to read it through unless you <coughs> want to, which I'd suggest it'd be easy to do, but you have it for the rest of your life. And anyway, so it's it's a great book. And um, But yeah, so when we're dealing with this incomprehensibility, there's no searching counting or a, never a full examination of God. Yeah. So the greatest theologian is still infinitely short in his understanding. Yeah. Um, we do need to understand, though, that God has revealed mm -hmm. to his people himself and what he wants us to know about him in the pages of Scripture. <clears throat> but because we are finite and he is infinite mm -hmm. and incomprehensible, we cannot fully exhaust all of who God is. Yeah, so think of this verse in <clears throat> Ephesians 3, verse 20. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly yeah. than all that we ask or think. Yeah. Um, that's what we're talking about. That he is beyond in his doing and in his being what we can think. Yeah. Which this is, again, why theology is an important thing. People, people think that theology puts God in some little box. No. no. Theology done proper makes you understand that you can't put God in a box. Right. Theology makes you in awe of an incomprehensible God. Yeah. I mean, listen to some of these quotes. <clears throat> William uh, or John Calvin, We only praise God aright when we are filled and overwhelmed with an ecstatic admiration of the immensity of his power. Yeah. Like, why can't I come up with stuff like this? We, do, we come up with stuff like that sometimes. Sometimes we say the right words. Sometimes I say things <laughs> that are good. <laughs> oh, uh, gosh. Yeah, that's, but, that's good, though. And so why this is important is it's about worship. Yeah. And our whole life is a life of worship. If you have the wrong theology, your worship's going to be wrong. But if you have a small theology of yeah. where your the theology of God and understanding of him is very small and it's not incompre he's not this incomprehensible being, your worship is going to be <coughs> very 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 small. Yeah. And if your God is limited in your mind, it he is limited in your understanding of him. Right. But if he, you've limited him, yeah. your worship is going to be completely weak yeah. and small. <clears throat> so, I mean, if you take what Paul says in Ephesians 
that's a that's a tremendous encouragement to pray. Right. That's exactly what I thought. Started thinking about when you read that. Mm-hmm. Is what is prayer? Prayer is our recognition that God is infinite and able to do and will do whatever He desires to do. And everything we have and everything we do is wholly dependent upon Him. Like when we pray, it is an automatic confession that you are sovereign, you are all-powerful, you are incomprehensible. Lord, if it be your will, fill in the blank. Mm -hmm. Right? If it be your will to make my loved one better, Lord, we know that, that... you will do it and it will come to pass but if it's your will that you will take them home to be with you we also understand that and you are good either way Mm -hmm. right that's what prayer is is it's a recognition of that Mm -hmm. well and i think too it it people can become so limited in their prayer and so i don't what i don't mean (coughs) is that we start sounding like kenneth copeland or something stupid but if you think of, just think of needs that we often think are just out of reach, right? That are that are beyond God's capability or something. A, a missionary need, a church need, a church plant need, a, whatever it is. Maybe it's a family need of a new vehicle or so, whatever it is. Um, and what we will do is we will use... Wisdom, and we'll call it wisdom, and I'm not saying that it's not there, but we'll use wisdom and we'll go about and try to figure out how to get that thing done. When God is saying, you, I'm here, that I, and I can do things that you that like are beyond what you can even ask yeah. or think, and that there's no limit in that. I think we need to understand that we need God to even pray correctly. Mm-hmm. I mean, the Bible says we don't even know how to pray as we ought. But the Holy Spirit intercedes for us and gives us the words to pray. I mean, if you were to just take a, um, a say you want to go and, and plant a church somewhere, and you just see that, man, this is financially, this is a big thing. We don't even know if we have the people, whatever. But you're fully convinced that this is God's, what God has revealed to you. He's, he's leading that the church that you're in that direction. <coughs> But you stop short of asking him to provide all those things. I mean, I have you ever read George Mueller's accounts of his prayer life, or, or down through church history, or even in some of your own prayer in your own life, you've prayed for things and God has provided in tremendous mirac- like ways that when you look back, you go, "That only is God." Right. Like William Carey said, we ought to attempt. Big things for God. Yeah. Because He's He can do things beyond our asking and thinking. Yeah. It's a guy that's gonna go to India back in the whatever time that was. Yeah. So theology doesn't again, <coughs> studying big things like this to me does not it doesn't make me cold or dry. It can, I understand that, but it doesn't it doesn't kinda like it doesn't lead me away if, if, from worship. It makes me worship Him. If your studying of theology um, just creates an, ap- an academic mind and never leads to doxology, mm-hmm. then you may be able to say mm-hmm. all the things theologically correct, but you are not thinking and believing theologically correct mm-hmm. if it does not lead to doxology. Mm-hmm. Understanding the incomprehensibility of God should not just be this academic thing you talk about. It should grow your worship and adoration of Him because He is incomprehensible. Yes. Write that down. I'm going to write that down. I don't know which one of them it was that wrote this, but this was extremely challenging and helpful. Our praise and worship (coughs) and contemplating must seek to stretch our words and mind to their limit. To reach toward God and yet understand that we'll never arrive. Yeah. Like, 
because I know this. I know that in churches sometimes it's it's always about could you make it more simpler? Could you could it be easier to understand? And now I understand that we need to yeah bring things down. We don't want to be so lofty that no one can understand it. But I think that every Christian should be should challenge themselves to stretch the limits of their mind. Yeah. We were given a mind to try to to try to seek out an incomprehensible God. And it it is work. It is. It hurts. It's work and it's tiring. And you you might have to read something two hundred times before you actually understand what it's saying. You might have to ask John Owen to say the things about yeah the about thing. this thing that he said <laughs> about the one part. <clears throat> it is. I mean, the I don't ever understand these things without having to go over them and over them and mm. over them and over them. Like I studied eschatology for years before I kind of landed that plane mm-hmm. w- where I am right now, and there's still things I'm mm-hmm. you know so. <clears throat> You know, there, there's all kinds of stuff that we have to look at, read, pray about over and over and over again, and then perhaps God will grant us that. I mean, it was it was Paul's prayer. May you have the strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, the length, the height, and the depth, and to know the love of Christ. Listen, this is what he said. I want you to comprehend <coughs> the length, the height, the breadth, the depth of the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. So I want you to comprehend something that surpasses knowledge. Yeah. Paul's screaming to us. God, the Holy Spirit is screaming to us. Stretch your thinking and your mind yeah. to its limit. Yeah. This is you like Augustine, Augustine. Augustine. Gosh. Um. So there's a story. I don't know if this is true, but he's walking. This this is why we don't get invited to conferences. <coughs> He's walking on the beach trying to comprehend the Trinity. <coughs> I'm walking on the beach trying to like find seashells or <laughs> fish like or you something. Just go the seashell route. <laughs> Here it is, Lord, my shell. Yeah. Collection. But he comes upon this little boy that says that he's he's getting water out of the sea with this little seashell. And he asks the little boy what he's trying to do. The little boy says, I'm trying to empty the sea with this shell. And so Augustine says to himself, it's a far easier task to empty the sea with the shell than us trying to fit the infinite God into our finite mind. Like this... (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yes, like right on. (laughs) Nailed it. Nailing it. And I'm just sitting there going, what am I doing with my life that I can't, that I don't think of these things? Uh, I want to think more. Well, here's the, this I'm encourages me to just to, to think more. Sometimes you do think of things like that. Sometimes I think of things like that. You know, we're not Augustine, like one of the greatest theological minds that's ever walked this. He's just this cruising. Thing. Like think of the providence of God. Oh yeah. That he's walking on this beach. This kid, random kid, is in. It, literally thinks he's trying to empty the sea with this shell and Augustine asks him and that's what he says at the same time that he's trying to comprehend yeah. this very infinite and to Augustine him thinking that probably was just a random thought that he had yeah he just happened to remember and wrote it down yeah um, but anyway all right yeah well that's good just understand comprehend the incomprehensibility of God and seek to Seek to comprehend the surpassing knowledge. Have knowledge that God's, (laughs) that all knowledge of God is is not attainable. Mm -hmm. But seek for it anyway. And seek hard. Yeah. Theology and study, it takes time, it takes commitment, it takes effort. Um, I understand that when you get home from work or whatever, and I'm the same way, I don't want my brain to work anymore. Mm-hmm. I just want to relax, watch a movie, and I do a lot. <clears throat> but it does take work, mm-hmm. um, but it's worth it. The more you know about who God is, which is what theology is, the study of God, the stronger your worship and, and adoration will grow for Him. And don't you, this, and we'll close with this, don't you think, though, C.A., when... You, even when you're working hard and studying theology, 
it actually is an energizing thing. Yeah. It doesn't seem to drain so much. It energizes. Yeah. And so that's the good thing about when you're studying the Lord and seeking Him, it's an energizing thing. Because you're you're seeking the God of life and life is being given. So Right on. There you have it. That's it. Oh. I'm supposed to You don't have it memorized. I'm supposed to do the every week. I'm supposed to do the thing. I just always want to make sure you I stay. The intro. I already had it, have it memorized, but you wouldn't let me. You didn't even have an intro memorized. It's like four words. Welcome back to. <laughs> okay. Well, we are. You guys be safe. It's going to get cold. It's going to be nasty. And uh, we just hope and pray that your weekend, your upcoming Lord's Day, and. Um, all that you find yourself doing, whether it's eating or drinking, you do it all to the glory of God.